Welcome to the Singularity Syndicate podcast. Today, we discuss a number of philosophical and sociological implications of AI with Dr. James Fenlon, Professor of Sociology and Director of the Center for Indigenous People Studies at CSUSB. Dr. Fenlon is also known for his book, Indian, Black, and Irish, and our conversation will surely bring a unique perspective on AI's influence on race and capitalism. And now, here's Dr. James Anlin. Dr. Fenlin, welcome to the program. Well, thank you. It's um, joy. It's somewhat of an honor, but it's really a great pleasure intellectually to be here. Absolutely. Um, first, I want you to please um, tell us more about your field. How did you get into uh, your field and what's your current uh, role or in activities that you're pursuing? Well, somewhat later in life, I decided to get a PhD. I was primarily at the Harvard Grad School of Education, and um, a couple of my great mentors were uh, sociologists. One was Charles Willey, uh, another one was Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot. Um, and so instead of um, working there with both the EDD field or elsewhere, I moved into sociology specifically, besides, of course, being able to teach in the field and discipline um, and the so-called social sciences, uh, was to look at Native nations, American Indians, uh, from a multiple uh, set of perspectives, which really led to my first book, um, uh, The Culturicide Resistance and Survival of the Lakota Sioux Nation. And uh, that was my first input into uh, the social sciences in an area that I think now is generally accepted, but they don't use my particular word, which was culturicide, which is dominant systems go to a great deal of uh, trouble, often very, very destructive, uh, sometimes relating all the way to um, what others have called uh, cultural genocide, uh, but sometimes just coercive assimilation and everything in between, in fact, instance, destroying native cultures, which we now see in boarding schools as one subset, uh, in order to dominate and keep them from threatening uh, the system that was built on their own lands. So uh, to linger on this, I know that our topic is related to AI, we'll get, it, get there shortly, but to linger more on, on your book, um, I, uh, of course, I, I met, uh, I got in touch with you like a few uh, weeks ago. I didn't have the chance to read the book, but I'm, um, I'm trying to uh, understand, is it about like the uh, preserve, preserving um, indigenous cultures? Um, and could this, could this be the biggest problem uh, in the field right now uh, or in your, in your area of research? Well, that, that just the title itself kind of undercuts some, some of the things that we're looking at. So um, the first three words, Indian, Black, and Irish, are actually the, uh, the kind of nominative terms that colonialism uh, and then the advent of capitalism produce um, in highly racialized caricature structures um, in order to achieve both its dominance, suppression, and sometimes elimination of other cultures and peoples. Like, you know, the, the thing behind me there, I was working in Cleveland and so you had this Wahoo um, or um, for instance, there they go as, you know, what is the honor? But that is to look at indigenous peoples or native peoples, you know, with their full humanization and so on. Um, so then we sometimes call that racism, but it's really the rest of the book title um, that, describes what I'm trying to get at. And it's indigenous nations, African peoples, European invasions. But then I go 1492 to 1790. And the reason why is because uh, I was 
developing a 500-year uh, analysis, and that became a bit much. So I had to redesign methodologies, approaches, paradigms in certain ways. And um, as I did that, I found myself, or initially I wasn't heavily critiquing capitalism. I was just seeing this part of uh, the great developments there. But then I realized that capitalism and colonialism, especially what we call settler colonialism, had gone through these same stages. And we didn't understand them in a holistic way. So that's where the book is at so, now. Very interesting. And, I, and this prompted me to ask a question. And excuse my ignorance in the field, but do you feel that... Or do you know that there is systematic um, and intentional um, acts to eliminate those indigenous cultures or to, um, or colonialism necessarily want to eliminate those cultures? Or do you think just, so what I'm trying to say is that how, is it still in our current day an intentional um, like an intentional um, act to still suppress um, some communities within our society? Oh, yeah. The answer is a resounding yes in all three areas with some uh, change, especially into the 20th century, but as late uh, and well into the 20th century. And that's what's happened with the so-called um, knowledge that has come on out, uh, both historical and contemporary of the boarding schools in uh, North America, especially Canada and the United States, um, which are which were specifically designed to destroy and eliminate native cultures, specifically. It's called Kill the Indian, Save the Man. And that really has um, uh, Henry Pratt. And that, that really now has become you know incredibly accepted. I view that as just one part of the 10 sectors, social sectors, and that is a sector of education. Uh, but they literally beat the language and the culture out of Indian children. And they sometimes why beat would, them to death, you know. And why would they do that, though? Like, what's Well, the because th there's a variety of reasons. And, and that's, um, so I'm saying historically, if you look at what we would call genocide, where you always establish intentionality first, especially using Helen Fine's analysis and all this rest of kind of stuff. You go, what are they trying to achieve in this objective? And sometimes the achievement can be ideological or some kind of a historical narrative. Uh, but in this case, um, and both of those are here, but in this case, you're also trying to destroy a worldview which could both remind you that those processes took place, which is antithetical to the idea of freedom and democracy in the Western world. I, I don't think it's antithetical to it, but I mean, it's viewed that way, especially for instance, like in the enlightenment and so on. Um, but it's viewed that way because we wanna see the Western world as being totally progressive in all ways. And so you can't get to this point, but uh, the process that I think is deeper um, and you can look at the humaniz humanization and dehumanization of enslavement systems, but and and I do in this work. But the process that is deeper, I think it's the deepest one of all, is to look at uh, the various kinds of systems uh, that destroyed and took over the land of the Americas. And so, what must be suppressed, I suppose. Uh, but what we can intentionally show within educational sectors, as late as the boarding schools of the 20th century, uh, and uh, certainly is effusive throughout the 19th century. And in most histories, in fact, the very history, like, for instance, we're in California. In California, the fourth grade, about then, everybody does a little mission system thing. And you're really kind of destroying this idea of native nations or tribes or peoples being civilized and having their own ways of life. And, and they specifically wiped that on out. So if we look at that, you're destroying this idea that there were nations and peoples with a claim to the land that we call sovereignty now. Right. And, and that's very important to try and justify the system we have now. Absolutely. And to tie this to AI, when you were speaking, I was like, <laughs> kind of uh, went on a, 
um, on a trip in my mind about what if one day when AI, you know, they're promising AGI and ASI, artificial general intelligence, which matches human beings in all tasks. And then there's um, another layer to this, which is ASI, artificial super intelligence, which probably, which which the name of this podcast, Singularity Syndicate, is inspired by ASI, where basically it's point of no return. It's a black hole of intelligence where it, it keeps feeding itself and it will exponentially exceed human level in all areas of intelligence. And I was looking at this, if ASI is there, if we have a super intelligence, would they look on humanity as a culture all itself as something to preserve? Or would they look at this culture as, oh, let's eliminate it because now it's the era of AGI or ASI. We don't need this pathetic human culture. So I'm thinking about like, would an ASI, would a, would a super intelligence machine treat our culture as, as something to be preserved or to be removed? Interesting. Um, that's, that's a good way to uh, kind of verbalize it. Um, if we look at Western society, and that's what I try and do in a 500 year analysis, my case studies only go to 1790 because with the creation of the United States, uh, which is view viewed as kind of a progressive form of the enlightenment, uh, it, it, it gets really complicated really fast because we believe, first of all, in this country, first of all, we used to believe, I used to work for the People's Republic of China, believe it or not, uh, besides on a lot of native reservations and in the Caribbean. And uh, um, so we used to believe that capitalism could only happen in democratic societies. And it also depended on two things, um, competitiveness, uh, you know, free willing competitiveness connected to the other kinds of things called free markets. And I've done a lot of work with world systems people. And I, I think I'm gonna ascribe something to him that he may not take full credit for, but the great Emmanuel Wallerstein, who passed away a few years ago, used to go, well, free markets. Well, where are the free markets? There are no free markets. Free markets. All systems and large corporations tend toward monopolism and tend to destroy their, their competition. So the, first of all, there's not free markets. And then second of all, the idea that capitalism can only happen with democracy requires two forms of thought that I find very alien in my own work. One is we don't really have a democratic, democratic system, certainly not for all peoples uh, here in the United States until recently. You could argue when that would be 50, 60 years, 70 years, sometime after the World War II or after the, the, the so-called uh, success uh, of the civil rights movement, maybe in about 65. Um, and then uh, the other one is the idea of both freedom for people as well as freedom for markets because the creation of the colonial system was the opposite of freedom uh, for native nations and American Indians, as well as the enslavement of, of peoples from Africa. And that's why the, 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 the enlightenment, I've been really getting into this more and more and a good place to go is a book that has uh, really captured the imagination for a lot of social sciences and humanities and so on as Graeber and when grows uh, the so-called dawn of everything. I mean, uh, that's the name of it, right? And really what I think they discovered is indigenous studies and, and that there were indigenous intellectuals critiquing the enlightenment and they go, enlightenment, look at how you treat your women. Look at how you treat your own children. We could see treating women or children from somebody else's society that way, but you treat your own that way. You have people that don't have enough to, to, um, uh, to live and eat. And, and then they go and you kill each other in incredible numbers uh, over God, you know, your idea of God. We, we might fight with each other and even kill each other over many things, but not the nature of God. You know, th th that's viewed as a kind of spirituality within us as persons. This is in Graeber and Rengo's work, and this is considered just an awesome book, right? So it begins a critique. They literally say it begins a critique of the Enlightenment. In fact, they claim that it actually changes the Enlightenment. 
I suspect it doesn't. I think it changes the rationalization of the Enlightenment, which is what you're bringing up right here. And that is that all of this, yes, we had to fix some problems. It wasn't free for everybody. It wasn't this, whatever. But it was progressiveness in nature, and it opened the doors to where the United States um, is at now. And if we believe in that, then we believe we're a totally progressive society that had to leave other societies, ultimately even parts of Europe behind, although that would probably be the closest societies and cultures. But we don't want to admit that uh, this society, the United States of America, or the idea of Americans, um, and specifically right here in California. In fact, a good example is University of California for about 60 or 70 years refused to address uh, admit or in any way um, uh, do work on the absolute pure policy driven genocide that occurred in the state of California, which sounds, which just sounds unacceptable because this is considered to be maybe the most progressive state uh, in the United States of America. And uh, the United States is considered to be the most, you know, progressive country or one of the most progressive countries in the world. Um, but it has totally caved on this, totally. And go check it on out at the University of California, Berkeley, headed into 2020. They had, of course, the pandemic caused it to go on Zoom, which makes it more accessible. You can find copies of this. They finally had a conference, and we were some of the people that forced that discussion. Um, and they've admitted there was a there was a genocide from 1850 or earlier. Uh, to at least 1870, and it was a powerful, powerful genocide by law ordered by the governor with the support of the United States government. And as that has gone, they've done a huge mea culpa, right? Well, if we use that as an, and so that's all happened. You can find copies of the reports in 2021 uh, that they've come up with. So it's completely changing the paradigm right here within this state or the United States of America. The genocide was a critical part uh, of the creation of the uh, of the country. So in California, the perfect case of what was true, I believe, I think my work looks at this a lot, uh, in the creation of the United States, you had to destroy the indigenous knowledge and claim to the land in order to build the new promised land, which we call manifest destiny, which is all these, you know, the, the ideas of God has given this uh, and all the rest of it, which is connected somewhat to settler colonialism except I believe that settler colonialism is problematic because it doesn't meet up with two things. One is it doesn't recognize the crown authority that becomes a state as driving the whole inference. And then the other one is the formation of companies. I actually list out the companies. They start in 1550, 1680, 1690, uh, big major companies, and that's a creation of the United States. So the companies, corporations, are actually driving most of the developments, not a deeper, better philosophy of the world. So I break that critique down into three words, you know, which is, you know, everybody always says, you're writing a dissertation, you're writing a book. Can you get that down into a few paragraphs? I'll break it down into three words that illustrates this. Enlightenment for who? Hmm. And very, very interesting. I want to know, uh, before we go into AI, um, where, like where you were born, like what's what was your childhood like? What made you interested in in this field? A little bit about like you as a person. Well, yeah, I was born in uh, Fargo, North Dakota. My father was born uh, not too far between McLaughlin and uh, Little Eagle on Standing Rock Indian Reservation. Uh, and like him, uh, but not like my sons because of the notion of blood quantum, I'm actually enrolled on Standing Rock. Uh, so I always grew up hearing a lot about American Indians, specifically the Lakota and Dakota, people known as the Sioux, which alone um, challenges much of the, the dominant or modern uh, history. Uh, then as I grew on up, um, I uh, had to face other kinds of issues. I was the last group of people who, um, I didn't even finish high school because I challenged everything in schools, right? Uh, but a lot of us were, I say we're a very revolting group of you know young people. We were revolting against the system, but our parents, you know, especially those that served in World War II were um, just thought we were just plain old revolting, right? Um, but I was the last group of people that they pulled uh, the, uh, the draft numbers for. 
So I went into the United States Navy, and that's where I learned about military systems, especially because I served mostly on aircraft carriers. And I began to realize that aircraft carriers are in premature of empire, right? Uh, and conquest and development and control. So uh, we're not defending freedom and justice out there. We're defending, you know, a, a capitalist, global, uh, neoliberalist um, empire, if you want to use that word, right? Uh, and then you begin to question the whole system. Where did the system come from? And you don't have to necessarily be only negatively critical of it. You can, you can state, um, as I do with the Enlightenment, um, Enlightenment is very beautiful. It's got a lot of wonderful philosophies, you know, and the idea of, um, you know, civic authority, the idea of responsibility of government to people. But again, it's certainly not native nations who are being destroyed and wiped off the face of the earth. It's certainly not African peoples who have been enslaved millions, the largest uh, transoceanic and transcontinental systems of enslavement the world had ever known, right? So we go, it's only for some people. And then one argues later on, and that's where I, when I get back out of the service, I start going to different universities, I go to the School for International Training, and I go, I got to go out there and look around the world. So I go down the Caribbean. And the very first place, um, well, actually, I went to Denmark first, which was its own world, uh, and a couple of other places. Um, but I go down, I decide to go back to it. I go through ceremony on Standing Rock among uh, the Lakota. And uh, I start to get visions. And so I go down. They say, you have to finish your master's. And so I do. And then I go down to the Caribbean, and the very first place I go is to Haiti. Well, Haiti is was then Hispaniola, so it's not only the home of one of the greatest, the greatest slave revolution probably in the history of the world that upended much of the world as a, as its enslavement systems. It's also the first, one can argue whether it's pure genocide or not, the first destruction of the native societies, because that's the first place where Columbus leaves a crew at and comes back to in 1493. He literally lands her in 1492. And it's what I discovered more and more, and I got on vision when I was there, is that the, the peoples there, there were five nations, and they had some of the most beautiful societies on the face of the earth. It, it's, it's kind of like looking at genocide in California. You go, no, 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 it can't be true. But it was. And so I actually start uh, this book with a picture of... Um, uh, oh, this particular one, this one's probably a little bit better. So uh, a picture of Anacaona, which a lot of people in the Caribbean know and hardly anybody in the United States knows uh, because she stands on up, actually negotiates with, um, with uh, Columbus and the Spanish authorities as a woman head of her nation. It's an incredible story alone. Uh, and it's like uh, these patriarchal societies hate her more than, than, than anything. And they, they give her an especially violent death by tricking her and the peoples. But the story is so incredible. Even, even Tennyson writes one of his greatest poems, Golden Flower, about it. And from that, um, I began to look at the world very differently. Wow, you know, if this was what happened in the Caribbean. And so I have four time periods here reflecting off of my own life, uh, because after the Caribbean, then I went down to Martinique after, I was a glorified English teacher in, in Haiti, but because of the things that I had done there, I got invited down to Martinique, uh, and um, yeah, as a teacher trainer, a language specialist, and then from there I was invited to um, Shanghai, China, and spent some time in Japan and Malaysia, and then when I come back from that, um, I, my original time on the first carrier, which was a pre-crime group, was in Virginia. I begin to see that you, the first development of the modern world system occurs in the Caribbean, actually in Hispaniola and Haiti of all places. Uh, that is Haiti now. Uh, but that's the Spanish and the Portuguese version of colonialism. The English who really developed settler colonialism really get started um, in a variety of places slightly before, but it's really the two famous places, Jamestown, um, you know, 1607, 1609, but especially by 1619, the famous set of projects now. And then also um, Plymouth, right, which would be, you know, 1620, 1621. And so that's why I create the second time period then. 
and it it changes the nature of race. It is the form. It's the hardcore formation of capitalism as or the beginning of it, because it's not even close to industrial capitalism yet. So mercantile capitalism, uh, but it mercantiles. Uh, not only enslaved peoples and become very famous for it, the, the English, uh, yeah, but it also begins to develop trade systems on land where it has to genocidally destroy the peoples and wipe out their claim to the land uh, just based on the Enlightenment. And so then the third one is the creation of the United States. You can argue when that is, 1790, 1787, 1776, if you prefer, uh, that goes until about... 1920, 1910, you know, pick a time frame in there. And that's the creation of the fourth and global modern time period. Um, and then I realized each one is producing different systems and different rationalizations. Specific, I started on race, but it ends up being racism, colonialism, and capitalism intertwined in into all three. Definitely. I mean, first of all, I, I can sense how passionate you are and and I think people who do the, the best of work are as passionate um, as you. And I, it's very inspirational to see you speak and, and, and continue to produce uh, like um, research and books and writing. Um, I feel that it's a story of, of mankind. Um, the powerful usually likes to destroy the, um, um, the weak. Um, and, and I think... It, it took us as humanity a lot of evolution to start realizing that when you destroy a, a community, you're actually um, destroying a part of you. And I think, um, you know, right now, I feel that there there is a movement of preserve, preservation, but maybe it's not as good enough. Maybe we always, there's always room to improve. But I kind of like have the analogy, it looks like, that you you would you know our our current situation as a human being is that okay if we are powerful we would show mercy and we would preserve communities only if our own benefit is not touched it's it's kind of like when we are we we want to build a house so i'm sure that all of us as human beings when we see a um, ants or whether we see a bee, a beehive, right? We don't. We don't intentionally want to go and destroy that beehive. We will leave it alone. You know, it's not bothering us. But once we want to build a house on that piece of land, we really think don't think any twice about removing a whole um, civilization of ants underneath the ground, or tens of beehives, or whatever other creatures that we are superior to superior to so it, it looks like even with modern civilization even with modern human beings we are yes we want to preserve weaker communities but as soon as our interest is touched as powerful nations and powerful countries and powerful people you know we will not think twice about destroying um the remnants of everything and i wonder now um the discussion of AI back to the original question, which is like, would AI look back at human civilizations and think the way we think about ants? And this is, I, I'd like to have your perspective here before jumping into like actual practical things about chat GPT and stuff like that. Well, excellent. Um, except I'm gonna take your allegory to bees because it uh, addresses other things. Bees are even better because they are so conducive uh, to important parts of uh, eco-spiric and biological knowledge and realities, if not actual survival um, uh, of other forms of life, but certainly human society on earth itself. And you know, we're starting to kind of kind of like uh, realize that. And as we do, one of the questions I ask in this book, uh, and I bring up uh, two versions of it, uh, inktome, which is the Lakota word. Um, some people say it would mean spider or spider man, uh, but is pre-civilized human beings, right? Or original persons. So some people see inktome as what they call the trickster. Um, but uh, I know other elders that say it's like inktome versus coyote is... Uh, 
you know, uh, kind of eats, you know, too much, takes too much, is willing to kill all the prairie hens, right? Or is willing to destroy the bees in order to get all the honey, you know, to use an example that you were using right there, even though that ultimately will causing Tommy and other life forms a huge amount of trouble, right? So we can use that along with uh, ia, uh, it, it's given different, ia uh, is often called not inyan, but uh, ia, which would be the giant. And so uh, forces have to come to keep the giant because the giant will gobble up whole villages, you know, just whenever the giant's hungry, right? It just doesn't care about human life or other people, right? So those are both allegories we can look at and think of bees and other life forms and say what we've developed clearly, uh, irrespective of how good we think it is and whether we think it's the only system that really exists. You know, a lot of the world systems people are looking at Tina, there is no alternative. And that's where people like Chomsky and others said, but there are other alternatives. Uh, and listen to indigenous peoples. Um, they actually have models and ways of interacting with the world that are more susceptible to our survivance and uh, what I could call our thrivance in the long term in human society. The only problem is we've been destroying them for 400 years, right? And so if we look at the incredible levels of knowledge and ability that we have to see things right now, but we cannot turn off our use of fossil fuels. We cannot turn off our, um, our societies uh, from this huge uh, consumption, uh, profit-driven model uh, that not only destroys any, you know, human society or other life form in its way, in its attempt to become dominant, uh, especially from the early, like the early colonialist extractivist societies, um, but it can get to the point where it clearly is right now in terms of climate change, where it's it it could end up destroying itself. So if we are wise, if we have knowledge, shouldn't we be able to come back and say, whoa, you know, we need to reduce the amount of carbon, both uptake and sequestration and so on. So what would that mean? We need to reduce fossil fuel. We need to have a different distribution system. So there are not some people like that critique of Graeber and Rengo's work that are starving in the same system uh, that will redistribute, to use the economist word, uh, you know, so that all peoples are taken care of. Maybe not totally equitably, but um, all peoples are taken care of. But we can't do that. We have not done that. You realize we haven't even done that in the United States, much less the world. In fact, if anything, our models have done the opposite. So that this last year, we actually increased fossil fuel production in the United States and the other dominant countries, right? So right. as we move to AI, we could think of this system itself does not have the wisdom or the knowledge to contain itself even for its own survival, which is clearly right in front of our face. So is there really wisdom? Speaking, of, speaking mm -hmm. of AI, I want to know when was the first time you sat, with, sat down with ChatGPT and what was your initial reactions to it? Well, I have not used it to the extent that a lot of your readers and other people ha or your viewers and others have um, about, well, I heard about it and just talked with people about it, but about two years ago, um, I was out there at Swarthmore College. I spent the last two years at uh, as a visiting Lang professor for social change at Swarthmore College, invited out there. It's really, really great position, right? And that's when, uh, as I've uh, already mentioned inside um, the, uh, at the end, they brought in the chat GTP people. How is this going to change all of, you know, what we're teaching and doing in colleges and universities? And then I suggested uh, from that something I'd already been thinking about as I finished this book, which was also just actually this year, 2023 is when it came on out as I was beginning to pull it together, which is, if our version of the world is partly uh, either inaccurate or constrained by our lack of global, along with a complete inability to see true social justice uh, in terms of other human beings, much less other life forms, that'd be the indigenous viewpoint, you know, literally calling it Mother Earth. By the way, in, in Lakota, you literally say Inamaka. And then in ceremony, you go Kunshi, Unshi. 
uh, makah, which means the grandmother's like, uh, the earth is like your grandmother. So you show respect to the ancestors in the earth that way, instead of destroying it. And so I was professing these and people were looking at um, both uh, AI uh, and, and other forms there. I began to express, well, if, because nobody has made these models, you know, and so we developed, uh, developed a couple of models in the Journal of World Systems Research. It's called Envisioning Indigenous Models for Global Climate Change in the Anthropocene. Um, and so what would a Lakota Dakota, ver, ver, what would Ikishwa out of, let's say, Ecuador or, or Peru look like, right? What would uh, a Mapuche ver, version of the world look like? Um, what would here, you know, maybe um, one of the California Indian peoples, either the Kawia or the Chumash, right? What would that world look like, right? But if our knowledge has destroyed much of that, if our system has destroyed most of that, it's like we can't produce that kind of knowledge. And at that point in time is when I didn't do a lot with it, but I began to question if we ourselves, we were some of the first to publish on the genocide in California, the professor Cliff Travser from UC Riverside and myself and the American Behavioral Scientist, uh, before Madley and all that got his book, which didn't really acknowledge us that he gets very famous for out of UCLA, American Genocide. And we already asked that question then, right? But not ready yet for AI, which was, wait a minute, if we miss that here in California, if we've missed that in our telling of the world history in the United States of America, uh, then what else have we missed? And how will this inform a kind of knowledge or intelligence which only draws from those things that we think we know? Because we clearly don't know enough to constrain ourselves. Absolutely. Would be very interesting for me to know with what you know and your professional expertise on the matter, I would be very curious to know if when you probe chat GPT and ask, ask it tough questions related to indigenous cultures and, and peoples, how would it respond? I would, I'm wondering if, if, because at the end of the day, what is, what is these large language models that they call them, right? Like what, what is ChatGPT? ChatGPT is the entire internet as a data set, as a training model. And basically the louder your voice is, the higher you rank in the, in the mind of these machines. Like if, if the, cause remember that the essence of this technology is autocomplete. So if you're writing a Gmail and say, I'm walking my blank, the, the algorithm behind the scenes is looking at what is the highest probability word that comes after I'm walking that. Now, with their data set, you've got hundreds of millions of people saying, I'm walking the dog. But there are some people who would be saying, I'm walking the cat, but much less. So meaning that the people with the higher voice, the people who have written so much about, I'm walking the dog, I'm walking the dog, are the one who is, these models are going to suggest, they're going to complete with. So they will be saying, I'm walking the dog, and they will give you dog as the answer. Although there is a possibility that you're walking the cat. So what I'm trying to say here is that it would be interesting for us to see if ChatGPT can pick up the uniqueness of certain groups and give them justice, knowing that, as you mentioned, that there was an active genocide to destroy these cultures. So, and destruction of the cultures in the modern digital age happened with shadow banning, with, you know, producing, like, not letting people like you publish or produce or or put things in the on the internet, which means that less of this content is being used to train these large language models, which means that the issues of discrimination and race and you know ethnic discrimination will 
still continue to be an issue for services like ChatGPT unless something has to be done. I wonder if I your perspective on on that. Well, that that also is very interesting and well said. Um, if we look at that suppression of knowledge as well as being what we would call an extreme minority knowledge. In fact, you could actually use native peoples, uh, especially in North America or north of Mexico as an example. I always have to do this with my classes. So you could do it at the English colonies or even before that earlier, especially because of what they call the great dying when the great disease waves. Always on uh, after the foothold of uh, conquistadores. So you go, it's never far from the destruction of peoples themselves. But they go from, uh, all of us go from 100% of the population to, uh, at its denouement, about 1890, 1900, 1910, to 1% of the population. And therefore, um, using, for instance, your allegory there, uh, except I'd push a little bit deeper instead of saying, I am walking the dog, now look at a cat, say, I am walking the walk. I am walking, you know, uh, <coughs> through life in a certain way, right? With a certain, I just was um, teaching a book that finally got put into print. He passed away, Albert White, and he calls it Zuya, one's life journey, right? Uh, and it's just a way of approaching life altogether differently as a philosophy of your relationship to relatives, what we say, taku or takuye, uh, takuyepe, so that all things are in relationship to others that are our relatives, including other life forms. And so your walk is altogether different. But what if that, as an extreme minority voice, you could think of like the native philosophies and worldviews, which I, that's why I start with Anna Kaona in the Caribbean, but we have, you know, uh, certainly many, many, some of have been lost, maybe forever. Some of them just have a few people left, you know, a few are stronger, Lakotans, you know, the Navajo, or, you know, uh, some Cherokee descent people went through Indian removal, but they have a worldview. They have a way of um, seeing the world and interacting with it, right? So what if that, if at best is seen as an extreme minority, 1% of the thought, just like uh, now we can argue it's 2 or 3% of the population, but that's only because we expand our idea of who and who is native and what constitutes, you know, a native society, but even at 1% or even at 2%. And that's the extreme minority. And what if out of those percentages, uh, then some have been disappeared and many are not fully reflective of that other way to view the world. In other words, they've been coercively assimilated themselves, right? And so, even without looking at the course of a destructive element that AI might engage in, as you were inferring at the beginning part of this conversation, where AI might go on out there and say, that's not only as United States, I'm saying has, and that's what my book pretty clearly says, right? Uh, but primarily colonial societies make case studies here, is that kind of cultural knowledge, that idea of a different relationship to the land, which is almost all indigenous peoples, it's not that they couldn't understand the concept of private ownership, they rejected it. And think of it, it's an entire social uh, construction, the idea that people own land. It's an entire social construction. It's, you know, And yet we fight and kill each other on the highest levels over that, right? And some people own a great deal of land and some people own no land, right? And some that we have stratification, all the rest of it. It's an entire social construction. It doesn't, it didn't have to be that way, okay? But it is, right? So what if it, by just its presence, uh, causes that kind of knowledge or thinking to not come forward or to be suppressed? Much less if it actively, you know, um, distorts or destroys that kind of knowledge or thinking. These are huge implications, and I think the field the field of um, AI ethics and AI safety uh, is a very growing th field right now. Um, people are talking about it as as AI become penetrates every aspect of our lives. Um, it becomes crucial that you know if if AI is a symbol of human evolution, then AI must adhere to preserving all minority groups, not only in America, but around the world. So I feel that this is an area with, um, you know, I think 
AI companies in general should look at this with a lot of and and put a lot of resources into um, combating the demolition of uh, of uh, of ideas because in the end of the day you know the world is a battle of ideas and we want to make sure that preserving cultures is enriching to the human experience and we should give that kind of goal to the ai because in you know the alignment problem that they talk about in the fields of ai is basically after the AI become powerful and develop its own goals, we want to make sure that these goals are aligned with the human values and, and the human goals. And therefore, we should make sure, especially in your role as an, um, you know, an activist or professor and expert in the field, to, or AI companies should really come to you and consult you, like how can we make these models more... Um, you know, making sure that these models preserve the, the the cultures, and I think this is a good good discussion. Probably this is the main reason why I started this podcast is to make sure to bring uh, the perspective of experts from a variety of fields, and hopefully the, these perspectives will one day uh, feed into the AI conversation and developing safer and uh, more. Um, um, more beneficial AI systems to the to the whole of the humanity. So I want to know more about now the implications you think of this technology on your field, on your personal life, on the future generation. What do you think about having an intelligent entity made out of silicon to be, you know, present in our society? You can buy a subscription. Right now, it's twenty dollars for ChatGPT, but in the future, I'm assuming that more and more powerful AI systems will be, you know, up for grabs. You know, I imagine that you can hire for a hundred dollars or two hundred dollars an intern, human level AI system that you can basically ask anything off, brainstorm with, think with narrow down your literature review as you're doing research. What do you think the implications of these on society? Yeah, huge question. Huge question. And part of it is the level of control one might have. There's a raging debate right now that uh, the conduction of wars, for instance, uh, is a hugely complicated uh, set of events, right? so that um, it's hard to control the changing nature of it when it's occurring. You just have all this information coming in, you're doing certain things uh, and so on. So people are suggesting that AI can provide an important role in that because it can entertain a lot more knowledge and thoughts and alternatives than human beings. Um, so there's two huge problems with that, but one is um, its idea of what you're trying to do in that war um, it would be formed by uh, groups that are conducting wars. And can it then take that as its own goal and begin to do things with it? And then uh, secondly, at what point in time does it have any sense of uh, bearing on the world, human life, or eco spears or climate change itself? In other words, if it has a set of prerogatives in war and it knows you're supposed to win that war, at what cost? And I began to think this, um, I have to be careful what I talk about to this day, but I was on the aircraft carrier uh, as a pre-com unit, um, the Nimitz, right? And so we saw a lot of different things inside their mission planning and so on, the nuclear destructive capabilities that they had. And all of a sudden we realized unimpeded, it could destroy most of the population centers on the face of the earth. So why would we want to, have such a system and we have multiple systems like that now and uh, those are within the naval systems the carriers and you know there's icbms and all the rest of this right so what if ai not only comes up with plans and models for that that are more effective but also um in the sense of war or whatever would think um 
well, this is what we would do to see that objective. And I know that was way back at um, the 1970s. And so later on, one of the presidents of the United States to remain supposedly a political, I won't mention which one, um, who had been in the service and so on, uh, began to consider the, uh, the possibility of, based on their earlier experience, that you had a winnable nuclear war. And I'm like looking at this, I'm going, nobody wins in a nuclear war, right? Um, so it's a little bit like climate change. So what if AI then becomes a way of us interpreting and viewing the world based on these, you know, really, really um, narrow self-serving goals of like winning a war? Or in terms of climate change, how do we do this but maintain, you know, uh, capitalist development, you know, to the extent uh, that very powerful corporations or companies, or let's say AI itself, if it was given that level of decision making, um, have to remain dominant. Like it says, the system as it is now has to be maintained. What if it, and of course, that's a question a lot of people ask, what if it, that level of intelligence has that level of control or so-called intelligence? And I think that's worth questioning, right? Uh, but it starts to go, well, humans have really screwed the sun up, so we're going to have to tell humans what to do. And then humans try and, you know, kind of shut that down. And it goes, well, look at how short-sighted, you know, humans are, right? Uh, they don't even know what they're doing. So then it takes over, which is kind of a lot of the rationalizations that the powerful countries after World War II have been using in neoliberalism, right? The rest of you don't know what's going on. Only we do. So if you look at climate change right now, it's very clear that the beneficial developments, you know, uh, of all of the fossil fuel work and, and other kinds of things have gone to the highly developed countries. So now it's then suggested, well, then they should take the lead and they should have make a larger sacrifice. But in fact, in every single model that has been developed, there's a smaller sacrifice in the highly developed countries. And we just won't, we just won't sign on to anything whether you have that level of redistribution. Well, what if, would AI be better? Some people, you know, but leftists and progressives that think we have the ultimate system might go, yeah, I could like do better than us. Or could it have a set of objectives and models about creating the dominant system begin to see itself as almost above humanity, which is a natural progressiveness of the West, you know, that we're in right now. And so we're willing to destroy much of humanity you know, um, in order to save humanity? Isn't that the one we used for our nuclear war profiles in the 1970s, which I literally saw the plans over? And are they that much different than what we have now? I don't know. I love, I love your analogy and it's it hits home. It's exactly that. And I heard some people talking about like, so now the US is leading the AI revolution um, but very closely to the U.S. is China, right? So the, the discussion right now is like, would you regulate AI and limit the, the, the capability of these systems in the U.S. and let China go ahead and continue train these models and continue build and increase capabilities? So it's literally just like the nuclear race. It's like... U.S. doesn't want to regulate because it wants to win the leadership in this technology, and it doesn't. It's there's no trust that Russia or, or China would stop, you know, even if the U.S. stop. So um, yeah, so this this is an interesting thought. I want to just give some um, some thanks to the people who are commenting on this chat and they're finding it insightful. Uh, Sujata Singhal says that she likes the enlightenment of who, for who, um, thing that you uh, tossed. And then uh, there is another uh, anonymous uh, who says that the state, the state's non-consensual human syphilis experiments Tuskegee, uh, apologies if I pronounce this wrongly, last, lasted for decades. What kind of impact will it have when the state's power is more centralized by these technologies? Do you want to answer that? Well, yeah, that's a real classic example. There's other ones as well, but since people are familiar with it, 
Um, the whole idea is that uh, I think it was primarily African Americans. You know, they had syphilis. They go, let's see it. Let's see it run its course uh, to see the effect on human beings, right? Um, without any sense of, well, these are human beings, and they should. We should be trying to heal them if we have uh, the medicines and so on um, or whatever to do that. But uh, could a broader, and you, to a large extent, one could say worldwide, the United States is a primary player um, in allowing some societies, I dare not name one, where it's uh, it's considered to be one of the worst places in the world to be right now. Um, but there's certainly other ones as well. And that's what makes Haiti so powerful, as I'll mention in my later case studies. It goes from one of the most beautiful sharing uh, both equal spheres and societies possibly on the face of the earth and then through colonialism, uh, a slave revolution where the, the banks even uh, conspired, New York Times ran a huge piece on that, uh, to uh, keep it down um, and to in a way enslave its finances. Uh, and then the United States took that over. Um, and then the political degradation that we are now laying upon the people themselves right now. So it's easily the poorest, most conflicted place in the Western Hemisphere, one of the five poorest nations and conflicted places in the world, right? So it went from this incredibly beautiful, wonderful society where even women could be leaders in ways uh, that were uh, uh, generative and good for all the human beings. Uh, to one of the most um, difficult, conflicted places in the world with one of the worst environments in the world, right? Um, and that's a product of colonialism and late stage, you know, so-called neoliberalism and so on. So if AI could, so I'm kind of taking, I'm torturing the example a little bit, but like the Tuskegee experiment, where you just let something run its course to see what its effect would be, um, are, we, are we even now half doing that right now? It's an interesting question. You know, for instance, in the United States, is anybody going to take responsibility, you know, for having done that? That's what my work asks, right? So if we have that mentality now, and I'm saying we do, then why wouldn't AI replicate that except take it to, like we say, a, a whole nother level, right? Which is to say humans muck this up so bad that it could even allow things to happen just to see, you know, um, what would be the best. And it could even rationalize that in terms of being the best for humans, because we certainly did in this country. Definitely. And so to debate with you on this topic, so you're thinking that maybe they should have paused, should have not released AI models to the public the way ChatGPT was released. You're saying, are you saying that? They should have been more careful. Well, should have been, yes. And the problem we have right now is that the model is one of global competition uh, for dominance. And so there are other, um, both countries, nation states, and societies out there, and China is the premier one right now, uh, that are going to implement systems uh, for better or worse in competition with ours. And so we're already using the reasoning. We can't turn this off. We have to stay on top of it because this other one is competitive with us, right? Yeah. But who can turn it off, right? And that's what that's what we are literally facing climate change right now. No, but we can't. We cannot turn off our um, fossil fuel system in our extractive economies uh, because other economies will continue. And we like to think of China right now. We can think of the Cold War. Uh, economically, probably not the same um, as Russia, the Soviet Union, you know, or who knows who it'll be next week, right? We can't do that. And so the same thinking uh, is driving us to the brink of destruction. And how could we keep that out of AI? I don't know if there's a clear answer there. Uh, but as you pose it there, um, we whoever the we is, but we within the so-called Western world, United States and Europe, that like to think that we have these moral positions now, um, we feel we have to stay competitive with other, other places and societies. In this case, as you just brought up China, 
who yeah. who can turn this stuff off or control it? I we guess can't do it in climate change. So I don't know why we'd be able to do it in terms of global knowledge. Absolutely, uh, Neil Wilkins. Thank you for the comment. I appreciate the support. And um, also, we have um, uh, anonymous as well, Dr. James Giordano. The future battlefield is the mind. Um, thank you for that. And then um, Sam said, beautiful talk. And so we clearly have a lot of interest in our conversation. And I want to uh, linger a little bit about the last section, what you said, that who can turn it off. And I think this is the correlation with your book about like how you you, you mentioned capitalism. So, and, and you mentioned also throughout the discussion how your views on capitalism and I think capitalism right now is playing another arguably destructive role, even in the AI race, because the same reason is that because we have a capitalistic global economy, uh, competition is rampant, and then you cannot put any guardrails on, on these technologies, even if they are destructive to humanity, potentially. But you, we really can't because other people will beat us to it. So if not capitalism, what do you suggest? Ah, that's the proverbial question there. Uh, we, uh, we, we attempted, or I attempted, using models we'd done before to do that in the envisioning indigenous models to combat um, uh, global climate change in the Anthropocene there, um, which is the question that a number of people, such as you know Chomsky, were posing, right? Well, what, what would that look like? Uh, but even as great as Chomsky is, the problem is that they can only see this within the nation state. So they go, well, what about societies where indigenous societies, you know, have a great deal of influence? And they went to, um, you know, Peru and Ecuador, and, uh, but especially Bolivia because of, you know, a, a short-term um, leadership by indigenous societies. Well, that's the problem. Those nation states are, in fact, colonial constructions. So ultimately, each one of them, whether it's you know Korea and others in um, in Ecuador, uh, said, if you're not going to help us offset our non-development in the upper Amazon, uh, then we'll just have to sell the rights. It was supposedly just a threat. Well, they did, and they did it to China, right? Um, and the same thing, they literally sold those rights in the upper Amazon. And right now, our best scientists are telling us the Amazon is approaching a tipping, a tipping factor, which is at one point in time, the reproduction uh, of the so-called rainforest and the ecosphere will no longer go on because it's all integrated as a whole. Um, and they think we're approaching that point in time. So if you lose the Amazon, which is the largest systems in the world right now, the lungs will that of effect Earth. on the world itself, right? And right now, and so what did, um, you know, Brazil was met uh, with uh, the election of their leader. They were actually increasing uh, rubber production, slashing production, and cattle production uh, in their periods of the Amazon against their own laws. So who, what does that other system look like? And so we project... Uh, what I do is I use Lakota social structures or Dakota social structures, I should say, um, and say, well, I think the world would look like this. And I was presenting this when the pandemic hit in the first round to the French uh, group called the Loire Valley Universities. And I was presenting it. With a, they just found me because I was reviewing other stuff. And they said, do you have anything? And I presented this. So the, the first time they got really interested, but they went to different universities um, throughout the valley. In each one or even different disciplines, humanities responded differently than the sciences responded differently than uh, the so-called social sciences, whatever, as to whether it was even possible. And it's like the blind men feeling the elephant, right? Everybody's seen a different part of the elephant, but nobody can see the elephant, right? Right. <laughs> and, um, and, and so they said, let's have another go at this the next year. So the next year we started to project it. I can't remember if something got in the way but either that year or the next year when we were really close to doing it, which is look at all of the different systems have to say, how do we do this together? We can't hold it in an individual mind at the time. And the studies that came out of um, um, 
Berkeley uh, uh, suggested this. And so what they did is they got about 20 or 30 universities in different parts of the world together. They also needed all their advanced models, but they needed different universities to run them together collectively as a whole. So they networked them. And so we were suggesting kind of something in terms of what would an indigenous model look like? Is it even possible? How would that change your social political system? What about your relationship to earth and other life forms um, and so on? Um, and as we we're getting close to the pandemic hit, and I shut that down. So uh, now that we're kind of reemerging, I spent a year or two at Swath when I thought about it, but in order to see, I'm self-absorbed too. In order to protect tenure, I came back to this university and uh, I found out that uh, they were using a little labor model, increasing the number of classes we taught. So this this last uh, semester, they got a nice little labor fight coming up on it. And this last semester, um, I was just too busy teaching way too many courses, right? So I'm going to look more at it next uh, next spring. Uh, but it's a powerful question in that we do have a a, a model of. Because indigenous societies are so diverse in different parts of the world. We're talking all parts of the world, right? For instance, the largest number of indigenous peoples in the world are actually in India. And they're collectively referred to as Adivasi. And for the longest time, India went to the United Nations and said, we don't have any indigenous peoples. We just have these people called Adivasi. We don't even know where the word came from, right? Which is really ridiculous because at 7 to 9% of the population, you're talking about 90 million people, right? That's a lot of people, right? And we found they had the same kind of some similarities to views of the world, ways to interact with the world. So what would that look like? We started to project, but now I'm deeper into kind of critiquing the whole system itself because um, I'm not certain how we move forward. I'm not certain how we move forward. Yeah. Um, can we get there? Yeah, I'd like to uh, kind of, based on what you just said and and the, the, this conversation with a question if you if supposedly we know that the end of the soviet union marked the end of communism as a system do you predict within the coming five years or so um and due to probably the effects and impact of transformative technologies like AI, do you predict that we might see the end of capitalism in the coming five, 10 years? And if so, what kind of systems could replace? Um, they are talking today about um, universal basic in income, which means that once AI becomes so powerful and absorbs all the jobs, and robots will be hanging around all doing all the labor um, jobs, then people have nothing to do. And therefore, um, they would distribute universal basic income to everybody. So if we are in that, that stage, do you think this would be the end of capitalism? And if so, are we replacing it with socialism or the experiences with the Nordic countries like Finland and Norway. What do you think of that system too? Because you know a lot of good stuff is coming from from that system. So I want to know more about like what do you see the future and you know which system you predict to actually replace capitalism if capitalism is gonna go. Well, this was the brilliance. I've been doing a lot of work with the world systems people, and this was the brilliance of Emmanuel Wallerstein, because he, along with other people, long before others, talked about what's called hegemonic decline. But he goes, a large system that becomes hegemonic over time, such as capitalism, right? But now it's globally hegemonic or somewhat globally hegemonic, right? And ultimately, it's the Chinese to prove it. So I was there in 83 to 84 at their invitation, and we made certain predictions. We said, look, capitalism doesn't have to be connected with democratic systems. And if they're democratic, I'm not so certain the United States is your model. Denmark, some of the Scandinavian countries, might be a more interesting place to go, right? So what they did is they developed state capitalism is really what happened. And everybody disagreed with us. Well, that's what they did, right? So the state, so you didn't have to have these open competitive free markets, right? 
So, and, and, and they clearly did a pretty good, you know, or powerful job at it, depending on what you think it is. So if we look at hegemonic decline, people used to ask Wallerstein, he says, so our, the system as we know it now, capitalism and the other system associated with it is in decline. And the, all of world history tells us that when hegemonic systems go into decline, there's a great deal of violence, but new systems emerge. And then so they asked him, well, what's emerging? He goes, well, that's the problem. I don't know. So he came up with two. Uh, one he called uh, Porto Alegro, which was uh, systems that might be inclusive of indigenous peoples that were more uh, reflexive to all people in the environment and, um, and other kinds of things associated with uh, stuff like the global social forum or world forums, right? And the other one he called Davos culture, which is the place where the great capitalist cultures and capitalism and the state structures are represented meet. I think in I think that's in Switzerland, right? So um, yeah, and he goes, which he goes, I think these are the two dominant systems. Uh, and so which will emerge, uh, you know, um, dominant in the next world, or will it be something we don't even understand? And he would go, who knows? <laughs> who knows? Um, but it is the global struggle we're in right now. And Definitely. Futures rely on it. Dr. James, it's been a pleasure. Um, your insights are fantastic. I'm honored to have you on the program. Thank you so much for, for being here. Thank you much. We say Pinamaya in Dakota for it means thank you. And then sometimes uh, we use the words wopila or wopida means honor to you, a kind of thanks for the good work you do. Thank you, sir.